So I will have to go fast. So we've been talking about workflows. I want to talk about data and why it's important. And I'm a user in the terms of I'm that guy that comes and says, you haven't given me enough storage, you haven't given me enough compute, and you haven't given me enough everything else. OK? And I'm just going to go through there. Thank you, everybody. So I'm from the National Cancer Institute. I am at Frederick National Lab, um, filling in for our CIO. It's one thing I wanted to basically show is the part right here. We're generating about one and a half to two petabytes. That's what I know of, that at least groups that I help are generating uh, per year. And we're generating uh, data all around the globe, probably another two, three, four, five petabytes. I can't really tell you what it is. But either way, just managing the growing uh, data that we have to actually use over and over and how we actually get that used is important. So I am going to go really, really fast and skip a few of the slides. What we're trying to do as well, you've heard some of the life sciences earlier, uh, is to integrate all of the structural biology, genomics and proteomics, imaging, uh, train the users, integrate the data into so dashboards using all of these folks so that we can actually uh, say something uh, in the cancer community. We work with clinicians, we work with the researchers, we work with people that do bioinformatics as well. So what we've been focusing on is automating your workflows in the cancer research. And basically what we want to do is I want to accelerate the people because compute is cheap. People are expensive. I can't find good people who know how to do this, but I can find a lot of computing. There's a lot of vendors, but there's not a lot of people generating people, right? And so what I want to do is automate the tedious. I want to make it as easy as possible to go through that, take out the boring part, Free up the clinicians, because if you ever talk to a doctor and you want to go in and get them to adopt high-performance computing or new AI types of techniques, uh, you've got a challenge. You've got to keep them in the loop. You have to make sure it's transparent. You have to explain to them what's going on. And you have to make sure that they feel like they're in charge. They can run it. Um, and that's important, right? You want your doctor to feel like they're in charge of whatever treatment you're getting. So you need the consistency, you need to be able to provide reproducibility, all the things that people have talked. You can see all of this. It should be easily documented. But again, to emphasize what everybody else says, has to be interpretable, has to be explainable. Okay. So when we do machine learning, there are a few aspects we look at. Perception, can we actually accurately detect? Right? So as detectors and sensors advance, we collect more modalities. We're talking about all the information coming in. So can, can we actually detect the information? Humans get sensory overload. Computers generally don't. As the volume increases, the computer's going to do more of that detection. We have to have advanced computation. Then there's cognition. How can we truly understand the data? And I think Dan uh, made a real good case for that earlier. We have to understand it based on a mechanism, based on the theory. What does actually happen at the biological or the chemical level? If I'm going to design a new drug, I want to actually know what it's doing. Right. So that requires a lot. bringing in electronic health records and other types of information and making sure all of that is coming. That's going to be computationally challenging. Any of the red fortune in the last month uh, will see that that costs us a lot of money. All right. So machine learning is all about data, and it's about speeding up and automating an analysis. First thing you have to look at the critical step is you have to actually think about the question. Really hard. Ask the right question. If you don't ask the right question, machine learning may not actually be the right thing to do. Okay? Collecting data. I've heard it say that we can collect lots and lots and lots of data. And that is true. But collecting really good data that's useful to the question that you're asking, that often can take years and a lot of money. It's expensive, and it's something you need to do. It's something we need to watch. Okay? Then you have to harmonize and analyze all of the data. That's where metadata comes in is really important. I have to be able to find it. I have to be able to share it. I have to be able to aggregate it. I have to be able to make a cohort out of it. A cohort is a group of people where I'm going to analyze. Right. And I want to make sure that it's generalizable so that it actually works instead of just it's great, I got a paper out of it, but then it didn't really work. That's why when we're working with clinicians, you actually have to make sure it works because if you mess up once, they don't talk to you again. All right. And when we look at the machine learning, it's really about pattern recognition. Generally, there's more data is better. And the computer sees data differently than we do. And if you've ever worked with a pathologist or a doctor or a radiologist, you will see the computer looks at data in one way, 
we look at data in a different way. And we're actually asking them to collect the data differently now than when we ask them when they collect it for themselves. Because the computer needs to see as many bits as possible, whereas they want to throw most of the data away. Okay? It just gets in their way. It can be really compute intensive. And we actually have to be really, really careful because machines do what we tell them to do. So be careful what we tell them to do. If it's an optimization problem, it will optimize. Even if it goes straight to zero or negative, it doesn't matter. It will optimize. Every mathematician should appreciate that. And interpretation is critical. It, you have to have intelligent action. You actually want to do something with the data. We're not just doing this as an academic exercise. We want to do something. So that means we have to understand how we actually got to the solution. Okay. So I'm going to go through this really quick because I only have a couple of minutes here. All right. What this really is trying to show is depending on how you collect the data and the data sets that you bring in and whether or not you understand the metadata that you have associated with it, you will either say, I did my analysis on this guy, I did my analysis using these, which I go, oh, gee, there's two distributions, or here I go, oh, it looks like there's only one and I can't really get them in subpopulations, or if you actually get all of the data, it may look like that. And it really depends on how you do it and the order and whether you understand the data and the metadata that you have. And that's why data is really super important, okay? For instance, is it, are you biased between males and females? And for a long time, medicine was really biased, okay? Caucasian, minority groups, ethnic groups, geographic locations, huge biases in the way that we do that. You'll see those in a second. Human and non-human, we can generally cure mice, okay? That's great, I don't think that's the goal. All right, adults and children. And I'll show just a thing here in a few minutes. It's really, really important that you understand they are different populations. Any of you have children right now? will understand there's different populations. But even when you do sequencing, you do sequencing, you do genomics, okay? I can do panels, which is really what happens in a lot of clinics. They do a small panel of a few targeted things and that's what you get. However, if I do a whole exome, which is just the coding parts, I get a different answer. If I do the whole genome, I get a different answer. And if I add all the RNA to it, I get a different answer. And if I add the proteomics, I do get a different answer. Your treatment changes, your diagnosis changes, and your prognosis changes. I hope I got quiet. All right. <laughs> Imaging, is that included? Generally, a doctor says, yes, look, circle answered. There's tumor. You have cancer. Well, can you get a little bit more quantitative than that? Can I actually understand? And EHRs are a mess, okay? Socioeconomic status. How many people have a smartwatch? You've just self-selected as sensors versus if I start analyzing your data, I'm analyzing your data. But everybody that didn't answer, raise your hand. I'm not collecting your data, okay? And environment and culture. You know, people in Alaska, they have different worries than people in New Mexico. I'm going to go through this really quick. Read this article in Fortune if you really want to be either scared or you want to see what it, the consequences of this. You get the wrong data, you have bad consequences. Okay? Adult cancer and pediatrics are different. I'm showing down here. There's various variants that we have that are common. There are some common pathways some things that Dan was talking about earlier, and those are all the things that are different. Where do you think most of the drugs are developed? Adult, because we pay money more, right? Children are still fairly rare. However, if we understand how to really take care of children, we'll understand a lot more about adults. Right? And to think that this is really like a long-standing problem, this is a long-standing problem. However, if you look at the publication dates, it's 2018, and since it's a nature paper, it means it's a big deal. Okay, this is science. In 2019, you start looking at, here, I have a KRAS mutation here, which is a huge bad thing of the lung. It comes down, I have pro-tumor, and bad, bad thing. Over here, it comes in the breast. I got different variants, no phenotype. Why? So as I start aggregating data, if I start just blindly using machine learning, be careful what you get. You're going to get the answer that you throw things in. And it may be confusing, and you may not be able to explain it because it really doesn't make sense, okay? 
And so these are just examples I'm trying to show. Let's see, there's a kind of a thing here, and I'm not going to be able to go through all of it. But if you see right here what some of the software that we're generating, here's male, female, here's the cohorts. It's giving you a dashboard of all of your data, looking at your metadata. If you look over here, we're looking at this really interesting thing. And it's basically, what was the age that you started smoking? Well, somebody put in 1966. Clearly, somebody didn't start smoking at 1,966 years of age. They started smoking in the year 1966. But if what, you put that into your, your normal machine learning algorithms, that is going to screw things up royally. You have to understand this, and you have to be able to visualize it, and you have to get to it accurately and quickly. And you have to allow the doctors and the subject matter experts to go in and really be able to fix this fast. And I have three minutes, so you're going to see me go a lot faster. Okay? You also have to be able to look at and help allow them to be able to see their tools. So this is, we work with pathologists. You can see this quite well. You take these tools, and we do, this is all out of machine learning on the, the far right here. All these labels, this is the number of pixels, which well, basically comes out to the size of the feature that we're looking for. And then there's a sphericity type of a thing. Then there's basically allows each one to sort based on its attributes and come in. Then we can actually collect quantitative data out of that, and we can integrate it back into the analysis that we're doing. These are the kind of tools that you need to be able to bring together to make your machine learning really, really imp impactful. You want to make it impactful, but at the same time, you want to make it relevant to where they're going, and you actually have to include the pathologist. One of the things we have is, can we automate? This is basically automating what happens. When you get your biopsy taken or go, they go to the whole slide image, or a doctor looks at it, how do you actually get that information through? And then can we actually do this just so it's automatic? Okay. And so here's the tumor. Basically, you get this. There's things like stroma and necrosis and epithelial cells. And this is a particular kinds of cancer. And basically, what the ratio of these across that biopsy actually determines your prognosis as you go forward. And so what do you do? What we can do is we can take these things and automatically segment this out for folks. The goal is to make this automated pipeline running in the background that hopefully the pathologist comes in, tells you that you're right or wrong, so that you're constantly improving your model, right? So you're constantly making it better. And so what we're doing is we're trying to make it so that it doesn't matter whether your pathologist saw it at 9 o'clock in the morning after having coffee and feeling really good, or 5.30 after he just had a fight on the phone with his wife saying he's late and he's really ticked off before he starts reading your sample. So that's really important because it actually turns out that what they see and what they don't see depends on the time of day and their mood. Can I transfer that? So this is going from, a, those were adult cancers in actually other tissues. This is a sarcoma. This is in, from children from a rhabdomyosarcoma. And actually you can start taking, we're looking at how do we transfer these models back and forth. And to our surprise, even though it wasn't trained on these models, we're actually starting to perceive these kinds of things coming, the, the cancer coming out, all right? How you train your d models really matters. And so whether or not my guys, when they first started training their models, ran the standard thing, they ran it over and over and over and over and over again, or they did what I asked them to do, no, shuffle all the data. Everything gets upset, start all over. What happens? The way that they did it, the way that's normally done, is you get this nice part, and we heard about quantitation uh, uncertainty, um, earlier, you see that here, and you can optimize and optimize and optimize, and it looks really good, but if you look in the real world, that orange is the real world. And so you get a much larger spread of the answers. So the really question is, is what's the truth? And when we don't have the truth, what is it? And what I really want to do is be able to get distributions, and if there's enough of an overlap, then it's probably good for what we're doing. All right, thanks, I was really fast there. really fast. <laughs> yes. Do you have any results where the computers are getting uh, enough of a pot, you know, true positive and no fa fewer false negatives um, such that they can do it 
often better than the physician, but the physician obviously has to check it. Is that happening? Yes. And Actually, in what that, examples? On that one workflow where I showed the necrosis and uh, stroma and the epithelial cells, that is actually happening right now. So they have so many coming through that the pathologist has now said that the numbers that we're getting versus them kind of eyeballing and estimating are actually better. So they're starting to use that workflow. So it is, it is working, but you have to actually work with them. If you do not include them in the workflow and in defining it, they are never going to adopt it. Well, I won't say never, but your odds are smaller. And they're kind of legally required to check it. Pardon me? They're kind of legally required to check it, right? Yeah, but even in the research environment, you still find the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Great.